So for those of you who are joining us perhaps for the first time, I want to remind you that we are discussing the seven questions of Garuda from the Ram Charit uh, Manas of uh, Tulsi Das. And um, in our last satsang, uh, we discussed uh, the fifth uh, question of the student uh, to the teacher. And for those of you who were with us for that satsang, would remember that uh, the question was, Kavana Punya Sruti Bidita Vishala. What is the highest good? What is the highest, uh, what are the highest meritorious actions that one can do? And the teacher answered that uh, Ahimsa is the most meritorious of uh, actions, not uh, hurting. We discussed uh, Ahimsa, and I emphasize in a very special way the interpersonal uh, dimension of Ahimsa. And as I said in that uh, discussion, you know, Ahimsa itself, the word is negative, not hurting, but it's a very positive uh, virtue in all of its uh, aspects. And so this was one of the important points that uh, Gandhiji emphasized in his own discussion of ahimsa. He said in its negative sense, ahimsa means abstention from hurting others, but in its positive side, positive side ahimsa is promoting the well-being of others. It is love, it is compassion uh, for others. In the issue of practicing ahimsa in interpersonal relationships does not arise, as I said last time, in relation to other human beings with whom we have good relationships, but in relation to those who, for whatever reason, hurt us by or wound us by their words and their actions. So the question which I asked last time, is how do we respond without hurting, without hate? How do we respond with ahimsa, with uh, compassion? And um, the, the guidance uh, from our uh, tradition is that we must learn and practice looking beyond the words or the actions to the underlying causes, the underlying uh, reasons that might explain why a person might speak in violent ways uh, to, to us. So for example, a person who intentionally tells false and negative stories about you, maybe doing so out of envy for your success, he or she may have invested um, his or her sense of self-worth in, in fame, in wealth, power, he or she longs for success, but finds it difficult to attain. And this frustration expresses itself in the desire to undermine someone else's uh, success. So understanding the, the causes of his or her behavior uh, may help us to control our own uh, reaction, to respond with compassion, rather than uh, with hate, because we see uh, the sources of the person's actions in his or her own disappointments and, uh, and uh, failures. So we spent a lot of time uh, speaking about uh, how we can uh, incorporate ahimsa as a way of responding to uh, hateful uh, speech. So this morning, I want to continue by taking up the sixth uh, question in this uh, discussion in the uh, Ramayana. And so following very nicely from uh, the, the uh, fifth question, which was Kavana Punya Sruti Vidita Vishala, what is the most meritorious 
kind of actions commended in the scripture. The teacher said, Parama Dharma Sruti Bidita Ahimsa, that Ahimsa is the highest way of being in, in the world. So question six follows uh, directly from question five. And um, the student asked, Kahahu Kavana Agha Parama Karala. What, which actions are most lacking in merit? So fifth question, which are the most meritorious forms of being? The second and question six, which actions are the most lacking in, in, in merit? Kavana, Kahahu Kavana Agha Parama Karala. And uh, the answer again is an interesting one. Because the teacher there says in his answer, para ninda sama aghana garisa. He answers that denigrating others, demeaning others in speech, in words. In other words, malicious or malevolent use of language about others is. Uh, the highest sin or the most unmeritorious way of relating uh, to others. So let us explore this answer in some more detail. But first, um, let us keep in mind that this is the answer which the author, uh, Tulsidas, gave in the 15th century to this question. So, in our own context today in the 21st century, if we were asked this, a similar question, which actions lack the most merit, we may answer very differently. Or if Tulsidas himself didn't live in the 15th century, but in the 21st century, perhaps he would choose uh, something else, uh, a different way of answering uh, this question. But this is not our purpose uh, today. We have the answer and we have the question, and uh, we want to explore why he chose to answer the question in this uh, particular way. But as I said, the answer is unexpected because in question five, the answer is ahimsa, and one might expect him to say that the worst kind of human action are those human actions are those that are violent. So, you know the the, the Immediate expectation is that he would answer, the teacher would answer question six by saying, it is himsa, it is violent actions that are unmeritorious. But he doesn't answer it in that way. He says it is malevolent words, denigrating others with speech that is the, the worst. And this is, the, this is what the word or the expression parninda means. It refers to malevolent or malicious words about uh, another. Now, it is interesting uh, to note that this mention of malevolent speech in Hindi, Parninda, uh, is not the only place that, uh, in which the text discusses this, uh, this characteristic. There are several references to it in um, in the Ramayana. Earlier, for example, in an earlier chapter of the text, uh, this chapter is Aranyakand, uh, Sri Ram is discussing the characteristics of, of bhakti, the characteristics of love for God. And uh, one of the characteristics that he mentions there, I mean, this, is, this, is, this, this is the sentence, he says, Sapanehu nehi dekhahi paradosha. That one of the characteristics of bhakti or love for God is that one does not even in dream, sapanehu, focus or obsess over the faults and defects of others. So he describes freedom from Paraninda as one of the characteristics of bhakti or love of the divine. And even earlier in the Ayodhya Khand, uh, uh, the author Tulsidas has the poet 
Valmiki in a conversation with Sri Ram, describing the heart in which God is present. And uh, there also, uh, Valmiki says, Ava guna taji sabake guna gahahi. The, the heart in which God resides is a heart that does, does not obsess Avagunataji does not obsess over the defects of others, but Sabake Guna Gahahi focuses on what is, and focuses and commends what is um, her, what is noble and good and virtuous in in the in the other. So it's a very important um, character disposition that the text is concerned. Which, why? Why this emphasis, you know, at least in three of the chapters in Aranya Khan, in Ayodhya Khan, and of course uh, in the Uttar Khan, why this emphasis on Par Ninda as something to be, something to avoid, as a, as a trait that is, uh, lacks, is unspiritual. And there are many reasons that we could um, think. I'm sure you may have, you know, reasons of your own to, to add. But I think that malevolent speech about another, malicious, denigrating speech about another, at least from the perspective of the speaker, does not take much planning or, or effort. One requires an attentive listener, and even half a minute is, is enough. Other kinds of unworthy actions may involve great planning, great effort, great time, even risks. But while little time and effort are required to engage in malevolent speech about others, the consequences are long and deep and long lasting. And it, it may take months, years, uh, for a person to regain his or her reputation. And in some cases, the loss of reputation could even be uh, permanent. So there are few actions that with such little effort can produce such long lasting consequences. And uh, the effects of this, these ways of speaking, the effects are compounded when we consider the fact that the victim of Parninda is not only the one about whom the unjust words, uh, the untrue words are spoken, but the victims often include, you know, family members, husbands, wives, children, friends. Their, their lives are also deeply affected. So there is a, there's a ripple effect that goes deep and that goes very uh, wide. And as I said, the, the, the consequences may be impossible uh, to, to repair. If someone steals an item from your home, it's not a, a nice thing, it's not a pleasant experience. But if this person has a change of heart, returns the stolen item uh, and uh, with an apology, you may not trust the person in the same way as before, but the person's confession and returning the, the stolen item goes a long way to repair the damage that is done. The person can has some agency, the person can do something, the per perpetrator can take a step to heal the wound. But in the case of malevolent uh, speech, in the case of Paraninda, even the perpetrator has, after it's done, has little or no control to limit the damage, even if the person has a change of, of heart, because words are not easily recalled. Like a wild fire, you know, that starts with one blade of grass and engulfs an entire uh, community. Words take on a life of their own 
and these words, the effects of the words spread like, like a virus. It is not easy to make amends or to repair. There is a story about a religious student, a student of religion who fell out with his uh, teacher and started spreading uh, malicious stories, hurtful stories about his uh, guru. Eventually, uh, the student felt uh, some remorse and uh, went to the teacher to ask his forgiveness. So the teacher, you know, welcomed him and uh, said to him, if you want to make amends for your words, I have something that I want you to do. And so he, he brought a, a pillow with very, filled with, with tiny feathers, uh, cut the pillow open, and uh, asked the student to take the pillow outside and let the feathers be blown by the, the wind. So the student did as he was told and he returned to the teacher. And the teacher said, wait, but there is one more step in this exercise. And the student says, what, what more do you want me to do? And he said, the teacher said, now go out and gather back all the feathers. Of course, it was an impossible uh, task. He said, how can I do that? The winds have scattered the feathers far and wide. I don't know how far they have reached. It's impossible to gather the feathers back. But this is the point that the teacher wanted to make. Now you're beginning, he said, to understand the power of words and how difficult it is to recall uh, the spoken uh, word. So question five, as I said, identified ahimsa or non-injury, not hurting as the highest value. And we may have expected that the teacher would say that himsa or hurting is the worst of actions. But Tulsi Das did not mention himsa. And there may be an important reason why the teacher answered the question in the way that he did. And here is my uh, thought about that. Why did he choose not to go directly to violence or himsa, but to speak of malevolent speech, malicious uh, words about another? And I think that the reason is that malicious speech about another, and I want to expand that uh, from just from our just thinking about it as in uh, individually to to the community dimension so malicious speech about another or about another community or group is often the first step in creating the conditions for violence and that's a very important point i think that the teacher wants to make in this text. That malicious speech about a group, a community, is the prelude to actual physical violence. Denigrating individuals and communities, stereotyping them, is the condition that allows violence to eventually happen. And, you know, all of you here can think of so many historical examples where the denigration of a group, the denigration of a community is followed soon after by violence against that community. So even though Tulsi Das is speaking to us from the 15th century, I think here is where his words continue to be relevant for us because we can broaden the scope 
of what he is saying. Racism is a form of Paraninda, denigrating a racial group. Sexism is a form of Paraninda, the denigration of women or any, any other uh, sex identity. Perpetuating false stories about people of other religions is Parninda. Denouncing an ethnic group is Parninda. So there is religious Parninda, there is race Parninda, there is ethnic Parninda, there is gender Parninda, all of which can contribute eventually to, to violence. Because violence requires hate, hate of the other. We, are, we don't, we're not violent towards those who we love and in whom we see ourselves, those we regard as belonging to the community of which we are part. Violence requires that we distance ourselves from the other. And that distancing is often, often happens through language, words. Words are the first step to create distance between one group and another. To say that the other is not like us, to negativize the other, to strip the other of his or her human dignity, and then to allow uh, violence to uh, uh, develop. So denigrating those who are different from us, denigrating immigrants, denigrating migrants. In these, in these times also we have seen that uh, denigrating Asians, you know, many Asians in the United States have had to deal with verbal abuse and even physical abuse because they have been stereotyped as responsible for the, the corona virus. So words can very easily translate into uh, violence. And so I, I think this is the insight that we can take this morning from the teacher's answer. And therefore, what are our obligations as we, as we contemplate this text? I think that our obligation is a deeply ethical obligation. And this is, we have an obligation wherever we have the opportunity to combat Parninda, whether it is race Parninda, it is gender Parninda, it is ethnic Parninda, it is religious Parninda. If we find ourselves in a situation where groups are maligned, it is our moral responsibility to speak up for the other. In other words, the ethical responsibility is not only to speak up when you are or I am maligned, but to speak when the other is maligned when the other is stereotyped, when the other is, is uh, unfairly represented in unjust uh, uh, speech. Because if we don't, then our silence may be construed as support for what is, uh, being, what is being said. So our responsibility is not only to defend ourselves, but to defend others, to speak up on their behalf, especially in the, in the absence. This, this is a kind of public health program. Uh, combating Paraninda, we should think of it as a public health program that goes a long way to insulating a community against violence. It's very difficult sometimes, you know, to act after violence uh, has broken out. But by combating the denigration of the other, uh, we, we are implementing, it's a vaccination. It's kind of a vaccination against uh, the possibility of, of uh, violence. Now, let me conclude uh, with something from the Bhagavad Gita. So, I think that 
Parninda is very different. I just want to make that clarification. Parninda is very different from the judgments that we are sometimes called to make about others as part of our, as part of our work. So using myself as an example, you know, uh, as when I was uh, head of the Department of Religion at my college, I often had to evaluate my colleagues uh, on, on various aspects of their work, their teaching, their scholarship, um, their service to the community, and uh, so on. So we often find ourselves where we have to evaluate the performance of those who work with us in oral or written uh, reports. Now, the characteristic of Parninda that uh, the Ramayana is speaking about is delight in demeaning another in speech with the intention of causing harm and inflicting pain. That is what Parninda is. Delight in demeaning another in speech with the intention of causing harm or hurting. In the case where you know we are called upon to evaluate others, the context is very different. And as in contrast to Parninda, I want to offer you uh, to conclude this verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, a very in, beautiful and insightful verse from the seven, 17th chapter, verse 15. And in this verse, uh, Sri Krishna speaks about what he calls Vang Tapas, Vak Tapas, the discipline of speech. The discipline of speech, which is a contrast. So Vak Tapas or disciplined speech is very different from Paraninda. And he gives four characteristics of discipline of virtuous speech that I want to leave with you. He says, Anur Vega Karam Vakyam Satyam Priya Hitam Chayat. Anur Vega Karam Vakyam Satyam Priya Hitam Chayat. So the four characteristics of ethical, discipline, virtuous speech are as follows. The first he calls Anudvega Karam Vakyam. So Anudvega Karam points to the intention. So virtuous speech is speech which does not have the intention of hurting or causing pain to another. Whereas Parninda, that's where it starts. The intention in Parninda is to hurt, to instigate uh, violence, to diminish and demean another's dignity. But ethical speech is Anur Vega Karam Vakyam. The intention is not to hurt to cause uh, pain to another. So that's the first characteristic. So Anur Vega Karam Vakyam Satyam. But it doesn't mean that our speech should be untrue. So we should also speak, you know, of course, also appropriate to context, but our words should be true. They should be Satyam. And very often, uh, Parninda, is always asatyam, is always untrue speech about, about the, the, so we should speak words that are truthful, that meet the standard of satyam. So first, anur vega karam, satyam, and the third is, third word he used, anur vega karam vakyam, satyam, priyam. So priyam is the medium, how you speak. So you have the intention, Anur Vega Karam, you have the words, true words, Satyam, and Priyam, the Bhagavad Gita points to the medium, how you speak the truth. It makes a difference. So one must, 
So preempt points, when you speak, when we have to speak the truth to another, we should speak the truth uh, empathetically. We should speak the truth with empathy. Cho words that are chosen should not diminish the other's sense of self, his or her sense of self-value, his or her self of self, sense of self-worth. Uh, so how we speak is as important as what we, what we uh, speak. So someone who is engaging in Parninda cannot see cover, simply saying, you know, that I'm speaking the truth. I'm speaking my mind, I'm telling the, the truth. Are you also Anudvega Karam? What is your intention in telling the truth? And what is the medium with which you are speaking the truth? So first, Anudvega Karam, Satyam, Priyam, and then the last word that Sri Krishna uses here is hitam, beneficial, constructive. They point to the outcome. What is the outcome that you're hoping for when you speak? You want to help the other. You want to be constructive um, to the other. You want, to be, you want your words to, be, to benefit um, the other. So even when you have to offer a critical evaluation, the point is ultimately to help the person become better at what he or she is, is uh, doing. So these are the four, and, and, and they're often challenging to balance, but I think in this verse of the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna gives us the essential ingredients of the kind of speech we should aspire to as a way of combating and not engaging and avoiding uh, Parninda. This is the, in other words, Vak Tapas or discipline of speech is the antidote uh, in the Bhagavad Gita to malevolent speech about a community, a group, about um, individuals. So this is what we should uh, all be aspiring to develop. Um, this discipline, Vak Tapas, discipline of speech that requires uh, mindfulness and which is characterized by good intention, Anudvega Karam, by truth, by a pleasant uh, medium that, that does not diminish the self worth of the other, and which always aims uh, to have a constructive or beneficial uh, outcome. So I think this uh, answer. Um, of Tulsidas reminds us of the power of words, the power of words for good and uh, for harm. And uh, we should take it very, we should all take it very seriously and uh, strive to cultivate this Vak Tapas, which is a self asadhana, it's a spiritual discipline, learning to be attentive and mindful to the words that we use, especially about the other especially about other communities, especially about those who are different uh, from, from us. This is a great step towards the practice of uh, Ahimsa and a great lesson for us all uh, this, this morning. So I will stop here and perhaps, you know, have a couple of questions or comments if you have. So Anandji, I have a question. We, we in our work are trying to um, address injustices in the world and often the way we have to do that is through our words and I think you've already given the answer but maybe you can speak again about how to hold a mirror to, it's really to ourselves and to everyone around us without seeming to be blaming and uh, uh, using harsh words and committing this parninda? Well, thank you for that uh, question, uh, Sunita. And as you said, you know, I think uh, the answer is, is finding the balance among the, in the four characteristics of virtuous or ethical speech that I uh, referenced from the Bhagavad Gita. You know, all four must be, must be present to have to satisfy the, the high criteria. But 
even I think even when and, and as I said uh, as part of my presentation is that we have a moral obligation a religious obligation an ethical obligation to speak on behalf of those who whose self were those uh, those whose dignity are diminished by the way in which others represent them the way in which others uh, speak about them but in doing that in speaking up for them which is very important and uh, unnecessary i think we we have to find a way because if we want to say that you know all human beings have dignity and all human beings uh, have self worth that uh, we have to speak for those whose self worth is diminished by others without diminishing the self worth of the oppressor as well this, we have to speak the truth as you as we said but we have to do it in a way that is constructive where we want to lift up um we want to lift up every everyone and that's a balance it's a fine it's a fine balance um because we we have a responsibility sometimes to be critical of uh of the ways in which others are treated of the structures that uh diminish people's uh self worth but we want to do it in a way that calls them to a higher ideal we want to always uphold the higher ideal uh to which we must all be loyal thank thank you so i have a question professor hambachan yes, can you hear me okay i can hear you very well then okay thank you so it's uh, along the same line that sunita ji asked you this question to this, you know speak up against injustice there are those uh, famous words of father newmiller that we should stand up for uh, you know the rights of others and uh, to speak up for justice so you know you know you have beautifully explained and you know that was my question as well and what uh, i feel that uh, uh, based on today's discussion that uh, you know if i could appeal to the bur self of others because others are not necessarily demonic but uh, if uh, the way we say it and that the way we present our case that look uh, this is really injustice and uh, you know bring out the best of them and i think that may go a much uh, uh, much longer way than to kind of uh, put them down so that's how i think uh, could be a way to proceed further Thank you very much for that, Ned. I think it follows very beautifully from uh, what uh, Sneek uh, uh, and uh, I think both of you recognize our responsibility um, to stand up, you know, for those who are treated unjustly. But as you suggest, Ned, you know, we are not going to. And this is a, a very important insight of our tradition, but I think on the whole of all tradition, that we don't overcome hate by hate. we don't um we don't overcome violence by by violence and you know if we want to achieve peace we have to become peace mm -hmm. also uh, this is a fundamental uh, insight and, and and part of what we are discussing this morning is how we can choose words yeah like injustice uh words that don't um resist hate with with hate and I like the point you made uh, very much because I think it's also something that is important uh, to the tradition from which we we come. And this is that we don't see human nature as intrinsically corrupt and flawed. We see the if we have if you had to ask you know what is the fundamental human problem we would say you know it's a problem of ignorance. lack of proper understanding of self and self in relation to the divine and self in relation to to others so human nature is not intrinsically corrupt um uh, we have to and uh, avidya can be overcome in other words there's a certain measure of optimism that we have, we can appeal to the higher nature of the of the other it's not easy it's it's challenging and i don't mean to 
to uh, minimize, you know, uh, the violence that can spring when people act out of this ignorance. But I, I think it is a still a fundamental teaching of the tradition that human nature at its deepest level is good. And we have to, to find a way to reach and to allow that uh, intrinsic goodness to manifest itself, to express itself. And it's, it's not going to happen if by denigrating um, the other, by, by speech that is full of hate and that diminishes um, the, the other. So I think both of your, your comments, you know, add, add very well the questions to what we are saying this morning. Thank you for that, Ned. Thank you. Thank you. And May I, I offer one example that I saw work that is very much in line with this thinking. It was, oh, perhaps 10, 15 years ago, and I attended a conference uh, about the conservation of land. And this, of course, can often be a very contentious issue because it comes up against the principle of private ownership and having control over your own land and so on. And there was a group that was trying to establish a continuous green corridor from the Cascade Mountains of Washington State down to Puget Sound. And most of the land along that corridor was privately held. Some was national forest, some was state forest, but the majority of it was privately held. And so their challenge was how to speak with landowners who were very protective of their land and of their rights to use their land as they wish, at the same time as holding this vision of a green corridor that would run 100 miles. And they found an approach that was amazingly successful. They held a series of public meetings uh, in communities along the corridor where they asked the question, how would you most like to see this land a hundred years from now when your great grandchildren are around? And by framing the question in that way of a longer vision it was amazing how much agreement on land use policies they actually were able to achieve. Right? And it did exactly what you said. They avoided making critical comments. They avoided, they were very careful with the words they used. And they presented the question in a way that would draw out the very best in everybody who was participating and was amazingly successful. That's a great example, um, John. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, exactly illustrates uh, the, the ideals to which we must aspire. Thank you. So thank you very much for joining us, all of you, this morning.